I have pledged myself and my colleagues in the cabinet to a continuous encouragement of initiative, responsibility and energy in serving the public interest. Let every public servant know, whether his post is high or low, that a man's rank and reputation in this administration will be determined by the size of the job he does, and not by the size of his staff, his office or his budget. The success of this government, and thus the success of our nation, depends in the last analysis upon the quality of our career services. War will exist until that distant day when the conscientious objector enjoys the same reputation and prestige that the warrior does today. In the Chinese language, the word, crisis, is composed of two characters, one representing danger and the other, opportunity. Rising tide lifts all boats. To further the appreciation of culture among all the people, to increase respect for the creative individual, to widen participation by all the processes and fulfillments of art, this is one of the fascinating challenges of these days. We can say with some assurance that, although children may be the victims of fate, they will not be the victims of our neglect. I look forward to an America which will not be afraid of grace and beauty, an America which will reward achievement in the arts as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. The federal budget can and should be made an instrument of prosperity and stability, not a deterrent to recovery. We must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda, it is a form of truth. The time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining, by filling three basic gaps in our anti-recession protection. It may be different elsewhere. But democratic society, in it, the highest duty of the writer, the composer, the artist is to remain true to himself and to let the chips fall where they may. It is increasingly clear that no matter what party is in power, so long as our national security needs keep rising, an economy hampered by restrictive tax rates will never produce enough jobs or enough profits. Too often in the past, we have thought of the artist as an idler and dilettante and of the lover of arts as somehow sissy and effete. We have done both an injustice. The life of the artist is, in relation to his work, stern and lonely. He has labored hard, often amid deprivation, to perfect his skill. He has turned aside from quick success in order to strip his vision of everything secondary or cheapening. His working life is marked by intense application and intense discipline. Our deep spiritual confidence that this nation will survive the perils of today, which may well be with us for decades to come, compels us to invest in our nation's future, to consider and meet our obligations to our children and the numberless generations that will follow. A nation reveals itself not only by the men it produces but also by the men it honors, the men it remembers. A man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. If freedom is to survive and prosper, it will require the sacrifice, the effort and the thoughtful attention of every citizen. The stories of past courage, can teach, they can offer hope, they can provide inspiration. But they cannot supply courage itself. For this, each man must look into his own soul. For in a democracy, every citizen, regardless of his interest in politics, hold office, every one of us is in a position of responsibility. And, in the final analysis, the kind of government we get depends upon how we fulfill those responsibilities. We, the people, are the boss, and we will get the kind of political leadership, be it good or bad, that we demand and deserve. A man does what he must, in spite of personal consequences, in spite of obstacles and dangers and pressures, and that is the basis of all human morality. Let us not emphasize all on which we differ but all we have in common. Let us consider not what we fear separately but what we share together. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. United there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided there is little we can do, for we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. I think the American people expect more from us than cries of indignation and attack. The times are too grave, the challenge too urgent, and the stakes too high, to permit the customary passions of political debate. We are not here to curse the darkness, but to light the candle that can guide us through that darkness to a safe and sane future. So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness, and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear. But let us never fear to negotiate.
That is the question of the new frontier. That is the choice our nation must make. A choice that lies not merely between two men or two parties, but between the public interest and private comfort, between national greatness and national decline, between the fresh air of progress and the stale, dank atmosphere of normalcy, between determined dedication and creeping mediocrity. All mankind waits upon our decision. The whole world looks to see what we will do. We cannot fail their trust, we cannot fail to try. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depths and encourage the arts and commerce. My fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow Americans, let us take that first step. Let us, step back from the shadow of war and seek out the way of peace. And if that journey is a thousand miles, or even more, let history record that we, in this land, at this time, took the first step. I have said that control of arms is a mission that we undertake particularly for our children and our grandchildren and that they have no lobby in Washington. If more politicians knew poetry, and more poets knew politics, I am convinced the world would be a little better place in which to live. Change is the law of life. And those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Children are the world's most valuable resource and its best hope for the future. For one true measure of a nation is its success in fulfilling the promise of a better life for each of its members. Let this be the measure of our nation. I am certain that after the dust of centuries has passed over our cities, we, too, will be remembered not for victories or defeats in battle or in politics, but for our contribution to the human spirit.